I love 418 and I love my Sacramento brethren. And uh, thanks so much, Rex, for, for having me. Let me come and share some of my Enochian adventures. So, this is my Enochian group. We uh, have sort of had a down and dirty, guerrilla style, urban magician, you know, Enochian adventure group in, in Denver for some years now that I've been very lucky to be a part of. This is um, very outside of any curriculum with any, any official Flemish order. It's just sort of a line of investigation that we've followed for some years. You know, I was one of those guys um, who's, you know, read all the Enochian books for 20 years or 15 years. And, you know, when I got to the part that said, yeah, yeah, you got to make this ring and this really cool table, I was like, eh. <laughs> I'm never going to do Enochian, you know, because I, I'm a nerd, and uh, I suck at making stuff. Um, although I'm changing that world a little bit these days. And so when, when I got to Denver, I met Scott and Diane. So Diane is our body master, and Scott is her husband. When I landed in Denver and met these guys, they had had an Enochian group going for many years. And they were kind enough to let me come and, and, and start to participate with them. And what they showed me was that Enochian can be a lot simpler than um, having to cast, you know, a golden ring or a llama and so forth. And so they taught me a very down and dirty sort of approach to uh, working within the Enochian system. And I'm going to share quite a bit of that today. And basically we stumbled across a very interesting um, set of entities within uh, the Watchtowers. And so we sort, of, we sort of began this line of investigation. I think what we discovered is significant and, and, and interesting and cool. And so basically, today I just want to share the story of our adventures with you guys. Before I get into those details, I want to spend just a, a little bit of time on some very basic <coughs> uh, history and background of Enochian to sort of motivate um, the questions that we've been investigating and the line of reasoning that we've been following with these entities. So what we'll do today is we'll just look at um, a very brief scratch the surface of some Enochian history. Then we'll look at the watchtowers, we'll look at our methods and, and how we set up ritual. Then we'll look at some of our results. And basically what we discovered is we discovered an order of entities within the watchtowers that describe themselves as being demons and investigating what that means to them and what that means with, uh, within the scope of uh, the Enochian system has been a very interesting uh, adventure for us and I hope to impart some of this exciting stuff as we go here. Many of you might already know that what we call Enochian magic today is the result of seven years of work between Dr. John D. and Sir and Edward Kelly. John D. was the court astrologer for Queen Elizabeth. He built one of the biggest and first libraries in England. He did a lot of work on navigation, mathematics, um, all sorts of interesting things. And he was, for the most part, very interested in learning how to talk to God. And so this led him to occult studies, and he eventually, he had an earlier scryer, but he eventually linked up with Edward Kelly, who was a very talented medium, and for seven years they conducted a series of conversations with these angelic entities. The result of that is what we now call Enochian magic. Now, Dee was interested you could say primarily in three things, right? He wanted to, you know, in the, in, the, in the classic story of Enoch, Enoch was allowed to read from the Book of Life. He was allowed, he was um, permitted, he spoke to angels on earth. And so Dee wanted to be able to retrace these steps. He wanted to learn how to talk to God. He wanted to read from the Book of Life. And he also was a court politician. So he was interested in espionage. He was interested in what was happening in other courts throughout the world. The way that I'm going to present the phases of the Enochian system is in three parts. They were presented with the Heptarchia, which is the part where he was interested in learning how to talk to the angels and talk to God. 
the Gebufal portion was about learning how to read from the Book of Life. And then the Watchtowers were motiv motivated by his desire to be able to scry or to peer into the courts of other kingdoms and see what was going on. So in this first section, um, the Heptarchia is basically a system of planetary magic. It's a system um, composed of uh, the archangels of creation. There, uh, there's an archangel for each day of the week. Um, and then there's six princes. And so there's a total of 49 angels within the Heptarchia. There's the family of light angels, which are referred to, they, they, they describe themselves as being ministers to the Heptarchy. So you have the system of 49 angels ruling the days of the week, and then the, the family of light angels are uh, Ilamis, Medimi, these are the angels that were sent to really like interact with Dee and Kelly and to instruct them. The personality is living within this group that we call the family of light, or sort of the, the stars, if you will, of Dee and Kelly's work. If you go back and read the original manuscripts, these are the angels that really were showing up and explaining things and fetching the other right angels to explain the things that they're asking. Now, most notably, this heptarchic uh, phase is where we get the description of the Enochian temple furniture that we're all familiar with, the Pele ring, the Laman, the table of practice, the ensigns of creation. These are sort of the classic, the sigil de Ameth, these are sort of the classic symbols and hallmarks of the Enochian system. They were given as the temple furniture for the heptarchic workings. The next phase, what, you, what they ended up with in that phase was really very similar to the angel magic of the day. Um, the Pauline arts, the Solomonic grimoires. Now the second phase, which I call Gebafal, introduced the Book of Loageth, which I believe means Song of God. Dee and Kelly believed that this was literally the same Book of Enoch or the Book of Life that Enoch was allowed to read from. It's also associated with the book held in the Apocalypse with the Seven Seals. This part is really a central aspect to the, the entire system because the completion of this magical regimen is what would have really opened up and revealed like the true angelic language, the tongue of Laogath. But Dee and Kelly never really completed this part, and this is probably one of the biggest, most left out aspects of the Enochian system when it comes to how the Golden Dawn incorporated it. Gebufal, it's sort of like... It's as central, when you start to look into it, it's as central as the Abramelin ritual for K and C to many other forms of ceremonial magic. This was a 49-day ritual that was designed to attune one to be able to actually read the Book of Laogath. Part of that ritual involves these angelic callings. And this is something that the Golden Dawn did a lot of work in utilizing these angelic callings to open up various portions of the watchtowers and so forth, as we'll see. And this phase of the work is really where we get the angelic calls. The 48 calls that they received, they also were given translations of certain those. The calls themselves were, were not written in the Laogathian tongue. They were written in a dialect of the angelic language. And so they were given some of these calls with their translations. And it sort of became like a Rosetta Stone for the angelic language, and so then they sort of were able to reverse engineer this, and this is where we get what, what we call the Enochian alphabet. But what we call the Enochian alphabet, what we use as the Enochian alphabet, is just a dialect of this Laogathian tongue. In order to really get to the angelic language, one would have to complete the 49-day Gebufal ritual, which would attune them to be able to actually translate and understand the angelic language directly. But from these calls, we sort of reverse engineered a particular dialect of this tongue, which is what became the standard Nokian alphabet. And this is a particular dialect of the original angelic tongue. It's not exactly the angelic tongue, but it's what we now work with as a Nokian. The third part you know, this watchtower part is a term that I think gets really incorporated um, when the Golden Dawn start to sort of fit all of these things into their magical system. Originally, there were 92 parts of the Earth, so these guys were interested in being able to scry foreign courts. 
to be able to look at what the Prussian emperor was doing and so forth and to sort of inform the English court of the politics of the day. The parts of the earth were given, there were 92 parts of the earth. These were different geographical regions of influence. Each part is ruled by a ruling angel of the zodiac, um, the zodiacal king, and then a large array of ministers for each part. The 92 parts were divided among the 30 tables of Loageth, which represent um, 30 circles or heavens called ethers or airs. So this is the part where you get discussion of the aethers. Isn't that usually like concentric instead of um, over a surface? Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a really interesting question because originally... Um, can you go just one forward and one back real quick? So these 92 parts of the earth, when you arrange it on a, on a giant grid, you get this. And this is what's mm. called a great table. So originally, imagine this table being here. The aethers were actually just the part hovering above that part of the earth. So rather than them being like the way we often see it, uh, imagine it, and like when we look at the Golden Dawn working, is these concentric heavens, right? They're embedded within each other. But originally, that's not really how it was presented at all. It was presented as just that part of the heaven above that part, that geopolitical part of the earth. The aethers were sort of like a puzzle piece. And so originally they were designed to be used to scry into those particular parts of the earth. And then this, you know, this gets changed significantly when the Golden Dawn incorporates. When the Golden Dawn started to incorporate a lot of this stuff into their system, they were not in possession of all of the D and Kelly manuscripts. So they only had particular portions available to them, and they took that and they completely fit it within their system of planetary and elemental magic. So there's a big shift between what's called D-purist Enochian and Golden Dawn Enochian. And so this is something, these differences are part of the questions that we, we end up really trying to address at the end. And so the great table of Earth that we just saw a second ago, it, it's a large table that arranges the names of these 92 parts of Earth on one grid. And so that's what we see here. So originally, an aether, you know, if you imagine this flat on the ground, like, the aethers would be like a covering of that. And so when you get to the Golden Dawn, as I said, these guys had only a subset of the D material, the manuscripts, the actual manuscripts available to them. They took that stuff and they completely incorporated it into their system. So they, you know, so it's it's going to be all of their 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 entire system. The, the way they saw the elements, the way they saw the planets, everything is going to sort of be mapped onto the Sinochian material. Most of the details of working with the Heptarchy with the planetary angels was never really incorporated into the Golden Dawn. They did have the material on the furniture, which is why that's such a popular thing now, because you see people making the tables and the rings and the watchtowers and all this stuff. So they had those parts of the manuscripts. The great table of the earth, or those watchtowers as we saw above, they had access to. And there's some details there, but we won't get into. And then they, they really did a lot of work with the 30 aethers or heirs. But again, you know, as we just mentioned, the way that they approached that, the way they used it, was very different from the way it was presented to Dean Kelly. The two big things that really got left out were really the details of, of directly working with the Heptarchic angels themselves. We got all the furniture for the temple, but then we really got no details on how to actually call up Medimi or really any of these Heptarchic entities. There's really no mention of the Book of Laogath or the Gebafal working, which is sort of central to the whole thing. And this is, here people often criticize Dee and Kelly for not having really fulfilled the system, not having worked the whole system. And I would argue that this is the, the major thing, that they didn't do the Gebafal working. They didn't attune themselves to read from the Book of Life. The, the manuscripts dealing with that were not available to the Golden Dawn people you know, in the late 19th century when they incorporated all this stuff into their system. These are the two big things that got left out. And so basically, one of the questions that we really were interested in was using a Golden Dawn approach to working with the watchtowers, how would you also use that, a similar type approach for working with these heptarchic entities? So out of that big table that was up here, this is just a blown up version of this upper left hand corner, which is, um, became the air tablet. So you can see, so this is the Golden Dawn incorporation of that great table. And just visually, right, you can see a huge difference. 
so they come in and they truncate each pyramid. It's color coded according to king scale. You know, they've added all sorts of zodiacal, planetary, and elemental information. And so you have now each square just being really what was just, you know, in the old diagram, there was a letter here. That's it. So now we have that, that same letter with all this other information sort of packed into it. And so with the Golden Dawn version of the Watchtowers, what you have is you have a really nice demonstration of their magical view of the universe being completely mapped onto these Watchtowers. So, Lieber Chinook. For those of you who don't know, there's lots of material out there on how to work within the Golden Dawn system. Alistair Crowley took that information and really reduced it down to its nuts and bolts. Everything you need to know about being able to just do some of this work is really right there in Lieber Chino. It's so simple that when you read it, you won't believe how simple it is. And this is really what I have to credit Scott and Diane for showing me. Because I'm, I'm a Capricorn, and I'm like overthinking everything. we got to build this stuff and look the right way. And, you know, and these guys are like, no. Just do this, and Lieber Chinook is just this bare-bones field guide to Enochian work. It's a short Lieber, really gives you a very simple and a very direct approach to doing Enochian work, particularly with the Watchtowers. This is what our ritual looks like. So, for us, we don't have the fancy table of practice, we don't have the lawman. And to me, you know, some of this also speaks to, you know, like Dee and Kelly, these guys were like obsessed with being pious. They themselves didn't feel worthy to talk to angels. And so the angels were like, okay, fine, bathe seven times, build a table, <laughs> brush your hair, you know. And, and you get this very, like, complicated, very drawn out approach to working with these angels. Man, but this is the new eon. And in my experience, you know, these spirits are dying to interact with us. I mean, they really are like, it doesn't take nearly as much as you might think. And so we do have printouts of each watchtower laminated, hanging on each wall, because what we found is, and, it's, and they're the Golden Dawn style with all the colors, which is really cool for scrying. So I found that these really colorful watchtower images with lots of stuff going on is great for sort of distracting the mind and getting into a scryer space, right? So we have the watchtowers in each quarter with just a basic altar, cup one, pentacle, dagger. We start with the banishing by pentagram, hexagram when necessary. We decided that when we go talk to the kings, we throw in the hexagram ritual. But mostly banishing by pentagram, the golden dawn grade temple openings, um, we use in each quarter. We recite the appropriate angelic calls. Now that's one thing the Golden Dawn really did some cool work with. They figured out how to associate the various angelic callings with certain parts of the watchtowers. We we go back to that watchtower. So if you so each one of these can be divided by a great cross or um, by a cross, and you end up with so this is the air tablet. And you can see that because yellow is predominant. Now, if you look in this quadrant, you can see that yellow is even more predominant. And so that tells you this is the air of air. So this whole tab, this is the air tablet. This hangs in the east. And this quadrant is the air portion of the air tab. This quadrant is the water portion of the air tablet. This quadrant is the earth portion. And this quadrant is the fire portion. Now, one way to remember that is, is to put a pentagram right there. One thing that the Golden Dawn was really good about was consistency. Everything sort of lines up at that. Any book on Golden Dawn and Okeana will have all the angel callings laid out, and it will tell you this is for the spirit. This is for you know the air of air. This is for you'll have a call for the air tablet. And then you'll have a call for the water of air portion. You'll combine these calls to sort of pinpoint precisely the region of those watchtowers that you're trying to visit. There's also, within each quadrant, there's a, a, a Calvary cross. So when I, when I first started with Scott and Diane, we use a pendulum on the ta what's called the Tablet of Union. And we would just randomly choose spirits to talk to below the Calvary cross. And this was really eye-opening for me because, you know, you, you, when you read about angel magic and, of course, you know, we bring a lot of baggage to these things. You know, you grow up in a Western society, you hear about angels, you see movies, and, you know, we all have these preconceptions of what angels are like. But let me tell you, brothers, 
Start going to some of these lesser spirits below the Calvary Cross, and it will blow your conception of what an angel is, acts like, looks like, completely out of the water. These guys have, like, tentacle mouths, and insectoid, and just very, very alien characteristics. And so what I found early on working with these guys is it's a huge mixed bag. Like, the kings, so there's a certain hierarchy within each tablet. There's kings, governors, cherubs, lesser spirits, so forth. And you can go down low into the tablet, or you can go high from the kings down to the lesser spirits. And you get everything from your standard conception of, is this an angel? No, it's Sandalfon's foot in my face. Ah. <laughs> to, what the hell is this chthonic, tentacly, insectoid thing, you know? And so there's a huge array of experiences here. And so in Liber Chinook, you get Crowley used a translation from the Goetia as this evocation, where you basically, it, it translates to, Hey, spirit, you answer to this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and I'm really cool with this guy, so show up and answer my questions, you know. That's basically what the evocation says. And then we have our scrying session. In our sessions, there's three of us. I think in almost all the cases I'm going to present today, I was the magician, Scott was the scryer, and Diane was the scribe. So the session looks like going through I'll do a banishing, I'll do the temple opening, recite the calls, recite the evocation, and then a spirit will show up and my scryer will start to interact with him and will question the spirit. And you know, that's been another really exciting thing about this, this, uh, these adventures is just learning how to talk to these guys. You know, they're very riddly. <laughs> they live outside of time. You know, they explained it to me like, so when you ask them moral questions, for example, this is interesting to me, they don't really understand morality which I find is, like, super interesting because... I, and I asked them about this, and they said that we live in a particular illusion of time that forces us to get up in the beginning of the day and say, we want to be productive. What's the best thing to do today? And, you know, and that's sort of the birthplace of morality. You know? And so when you're interacting with entities that live outside of this illusion of time, like, they handle moral questions in, like, a really interesting, bizarre way. You know, they don't know necessarily what you mean by best. What they mean by the, what's the best and what you mean by what's the, what's the best can always be very different. So, like, learning how to ask your questions can have an enormous effect on the kind of uh, responses you get. Right? A few years ago, when I, when I first really started working with Scott and Diane, I was working in one of the, we have three active Golden Dawn groups in Denver, and so I was, I, I took some initiations in one of the groups. It's the group that our OTO body shares space with. And when, when I got into Malkuth, I had this notion that part of that grade work was about balancing the element of that sphere. And so I had this idea, hey, well, let's go, let's call up the kings of all the watchtowers and let's ask them about, you know, what it means to balance that elemental force within, within their sphere. Uh, when I sort of pitched this to my Enochian group, I was surprised to find out that they were a little bit superstitious about talking to the kings. They were like, oh, I no, nobody really talks to the kings, man. And I was like, I, I want to talk to the kings. Um, it's a new eon. I'm a king. Why can't I talk to kings? You know? and, 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 you know, and my naivety sometimes bites me in the ass, but... In this case, it turned out to be quite fun. And so we were making our rounds and going to the kings. And another thing that's very interesting about, you know, when you start an Enochian adventure, if you're not sure where it's going to lead, don't worry. You know, the, these, uh, these spirits, they really enjoy side questing. So, you know, if you're not sure, you know, you, you call up a spirit, you got some questions. By the end of it, they're going to have you going and talking to three or four other people. And, you know, so... You know, one adventure really sort of easily starts to snowball into lots of adventures and lots of side questing, I mean, literally. We were making our rounds with the king, and we got to the king of air. I was the magician this time, Diane was scrying, and Scott was scribing. We go through our, our setup, we call up the king of air, and Diane lands in this enormous throne. I mean, she's, like, there's a, there's a throne in front of her, and she's barely at the, like, the, the balls of the throne that sit on the ground. You know, she's as tall as, like, one of those, right? And so it's this enormous throne room with this huge stone throne, and there's this tiny black raven crow type bird, as tiny as us, sitting in this enormous throne. You know, and so as we do, we engage, we engage the guy, and we're like, hey, what's your name? Da -da -da -da. And he tells us his name. His name was 
Twelve. And, you know, we ask, you know, are you the king of air? And he says, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm an emissary to the king of air. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Well, you know, we'd like to talk to the king of air. We've got some questions. And, and so he says, hold on. You know, and flies out the window. So we're waiting. He comes back, and so this sort of 45-minute exchange starts to occur between us asking this emissary questions, him flying out the window, and bringing us a response from the king. And that was fine, but I was feeling a little bit cheated because I wanted to interact with the king directly. And so we thanked Twelik for his service. And I, you know, I, I picked up and I re-recited re the calls and the evocation. And about halfway through the second call, an enormous hand comes down into the throne room and scoops Diane up in her body of light, pulls her up through the throne room into the sky, and right here. So all we saw of the king of air this time was this enormous eyeball. Diane was standing in its hand in the body of light, and so we got to interact with the King of Air's eyeball. And he seemed a little bit annoyed because we weren't happy with his emissary and so forth. <laughs> uh, you know, what do you want? You know, I'm busy, was sort of the, the feeling there. And, well, that was all fine and, and dandy. We had our interaction with the King of Air. He's like, go talk to Soaps. You know, he gave us a couple side quests as they do. And we continued on with our adventure with the kings. Eventually, we finished speaking with all the kings. And we're discussing results one day and sort of determining the directions we want to move. And I had this, I don't know why, but it was like, what, is, what was up with that bird? What, who, you know, he gave us a name. And I said, what, 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 what is an emissary to the king? What does that even mean? What is, it, what is this guy? And it was the King of Air. And so I pull up the, I, I pull out, I mean, we have the tablets all printed out, and I pull out the tablet of air, and I start going through it, and I find his name right there. And the, so this would be the water sub-angle. So you can see the, um, the hierarchy a little more here. Each quadrant has a cavalry cross, and, and these, were, these would be the lesser spirits I was talking about before that we really started playing with in our, the early days of our adventures. But now, we interacted with an entity who gave us his name, and we found this name, but none of us really knew what to make of a diagonal entity. There's a little bit of information out there about some of the diagonal entities, but it's, it's not very clear. And in our investigation, we had a hard time really finding really good information where people have really engaged these entities and done some work with them. Um, and so the fact that we had interacted with this entity, who turns out to be diagonal, was fascinating. Um, we weren't really sure what to make of it. What kind of what kind of being is this? An emissary to the king? He's diagonal on the tablet. And honestly, with our methods, it wasn't even entirely clear to us who does this guy answer to. Well, we know he answers to the king because he defined himself as an emissary. Well, what we ended up doing is we ended up using the seniors of the tablet along with the king uh, as people he would answer to, and this worked. And so we were able to construct a ritual which allowed us to call up this guy directly. Um, but it's very important, if you want to call this guy, CZNS, you know, you need to know who, who, does, it, who, are these, um, who does this guy answer to. And so within the watchtower, there's a king, there are seniors, there are cherubic angels, and so, you know, these lesser spirits will answer to all those guys, and so when you construct your, your ritual and your evocation, it's, it's important to be able to identify who this guy answers to, because that's sort of how the Enochian uh, rituals, basically, how the evocations run, is you're, you're basically saying, hey, you, I'm down with all these guys that you answer to, so now you got to be down with me, and we're going to have this conversation. And that was a real trick here, because that breaks, but when you get into the details of the hierarchies of these tablets, it's all based on either... Um, horizontal or vertical entities. And so when you start messing with diagonal stuff, it's, it becomes much less clear how the hierarchies work there. And what we found with, with our investigations of these diagonal entities is that the seniors and then the king work the, the answer to those guys. And so we went and we started calling up, well, we started with Twelik, who's in the, the water quadrant of the air tablet, and we called him up, and we said, Twilight, what the hell are you? What is this diagonal stuff? What does it mean? What do we make of it? And we, we found his answer to be extraordinarily fascinating. Right off the bat, without missing a beat, he said, I'm a demon. 
We said, we're, we're doing angel magic, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's a demon? What do you mean by demon? Without missing a beat, he said, a demon is a secret servant. Well, that's a really interesting way to describe a demon. Who do you serve? And almost unilaterally, they serve the king. And so, this sort of began to open up a set of questions for us. What are these demons? What are these secret servants? And so forth. You know, what type of, you know, have we discovered a, a, a new type of entity within these watchtowers? What is their role within this structure, within this system? And what exactly are they capable of? To sort of try to answer these questions, we started moving through the tablets and investigating similar entities. So if you go over to the fire tablet, so, you know, we're, we're using the classic Golden Dawn attribution, so, you know, we're going air, fire, water, earth, earth. And so, you know, we started here and we found Twelik over here, and so let's, let's go see what's over here. And so we go into the water sub-angle of this uh, fire tablet, and we identify precisely an entity in the same place as Twelik, in this case, Nanape, and we did the same thing. We call him up. We call up Nanape. Here we end up in this... It reminds me of like a Legend of Zelda video. But it, we ended up in this big stone, giant stone room. In the center, there's a truncated pyramid of stone with a flame lit right above the truncated pyramid. We're like walking around in this room going, where? Okay, there's nobody here. There's nobody here. Hello, you know. And finally, we notice there's this little spider crawling in the cracks of this truncated pyramid, trying to get our attention the whole time. Finally, we see, oh, is that Nanape? And we ask, Nanape. He responds, and we say, well, what are you? And he too, he says, I'm a demon. He says, I'm a secret servant. And we asked him to show us things in the watchtower. And something interesting happened here with my scryer. As soon as we started a asking Nanape to show us stuff, it's like their body of lights merged, so he was able to see out of the eyes of Nanape. And Nanape was able to... If you imagine the watchtowers, this is of course an analogy, if you imagine the watchtowers as being an actual structure made of stone, like a castle, what Nanape did is he took us in between the stones, in between the cracks. And what this did is it gave, us, gave me this notion that I had had this prior experience of working with the lesser spirits. When you go to some of these lesser spirits in the, in the Golden Dawn system, you know, these truncated pyramids are very well defined in terms of their elemental nature and so forth. And it particularly, I, I, what I found is true of these lesser spirits, is that when you go there, these lesser spirits are very well defined. This is why they have certain functions. This is why, you know, one, one guy's going to be better at answering these questions versus these questions, right? Because they're very defined by these elemental structures. And so right away with this guy, what we saw was he moved between the structure. He moved within the cracks. He moved between the stones, right? And this gave me this idea to try to use them to contact entities outside of the watchtower. And so I started asking Nanape, can you go outside the watchtower? And he's like, I can go anywhere, you know? So I, I started asking him to contact heptarchic entities for me. And particularly, we focused, for our, uh, we focused on Madimi, who's one of the family of light angels. And so this is the, the first guy who was actually able to like, get Madimi's attention and bring her to us. And so at this point, we began to realize that, hey, you know, maybe, maybe by working with these secret servants, who are now these diagonal entities, who are no longer completely defined by the elemental structure of that region, they can move between the cracks. They can move within the watchtowers, outside of the watchtowers. And so this opened the door for us to de begin to develop a relationship with Medimi, which I'll talk about a little more explicitly at the end. Did you find that to be a property of all of the diagonal uh, entities that you encountered? Yes. And so, we, and so after this guy, we go back, because Twelik. Twelik has kind of been our prime. He's the first guy we encountered on accident. He sort of opened the door to these entities. And so far, he seems to be 
in a sense, the most self-aware. And so when we get to more confusing guys, we often will go back to Twelik and be like, hey, what's up with that guy? And he tends to be able to explain things in a way that's, that's easier for us to follow. And so we do a lot of the going back and forth between Twelik and some of these guys. So he's sort of our primary diagonal demon. And so, yeah, when we went to him and said, hey, can you get Medimi? He's like, yeah, of course. I do stuff all the time for the king, you know. And they're like these messengers, these emissaries, you know. So they're used to being asked to do tasks. And so we begin to get this image like, you know, the watchtower entities form, you know, sort of the stones of the structure. You know, these diagonal entities are sort of like the mortar. They're sort of like the in-between stuff that's holding that together. And because of that, they're not bound in the same way that some of these other watchtower entities are. These other watchtower entities are this brick, you know, and they're stuck. And these guys are all in between there. So, um, if you'll forgive the, the analogy to the secular world, right, because, hey, I'm fellow nerd, right, computer engineer, right, so these, these guys are really more like function calls, right, that oh, are that's good. Yeah. hidden from the average user, but perhaps available to the programmer. Yes, and you, yeah, exactly. And you have to, and, 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 and if you're not digging in that syntax, if you're not digging into that code, you would never You'll see yeah. that they're, that they're, that that's what's, you know, that's what's mm -hmm. happening. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. And so then, you know, we sort of carry on our trick to the water tablet. And again, in this water subquadrant, we find another diagonal entity, Dega C. Yeah. Are they all in that spot in the water quadrant? Well, um, we're trying to, we're trying to discover a pattern. And so that's what, you know, we discovered Twelik in the air tablet within this water subquadrant. So at first, we began just grilling identical entities within the different tablets in that exact same position. And we've gone beyond that, and I'll get into it a little bit. But because we're basically trying to understand, like, yeah. you know, method of science, we're looking for patterns. You know, we're looking for a way to sort of classify these experiences, right? And so to start, yeah, we're just reproducing that same experiment in each region. And then ultimately what we would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to say something about this guy, about this guy, and about this guy, right? You know, everything has a beginning. And so for us, we're just trying to discover a pattern within this particular subquadrant. We call it Degasi. Degasi was awesome. He was a Nautilus. He was like this giant nautilus, so this is like Scott's little tiny body of light, and this nautilus, and he took us, of course, gosh, uh, so much to say, but I'm, le I'm trying my best to leave out all the side quest riddly stuff <laughs> that we are still trying to understand. Um, for example, Degasi claimed to be able to really like express the mysteries of the deep, you know, and he took us really deep in this oceany kind of atmosphere and there were these black bubbles coming up from the deep which he called dube d-u-b but he said you know he, he spelled it d-u-b but he pronounced it dube and this has come up a few other times and we haven't made any sense out of it but we're, we're still hopeful but just as an example you know you ask these guys one question and they're like oh well let me show you this other thing <laughs> and you know and so they 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 you know, yeah, so as, as the magician, you know, it's sort of your job to, like, keep these demons on task. You know, hey, wait, I had this other question. Let's get back to it. But this guy, you know, he actually, um, he was able to um, contact Medimi for us. And Medimi, um, with this guy, arose up from the deep. And we had our interaction with her in, in the deep, out of Dube. Now, not to hamper on this thing that I haven't made any sense out of yet, but... You know, the, he describes Dube as being, like, before. Like, so, it, it reminded me of, like, Lovecraft, like Cthulhu stuff, like the old gods, like this, like this, like the, the sort of rudimentary slime, which all this other stuff eventually formed out of. Anyway. And so a couple other guys have, like, taken us to this Dube thing. And, you know, we'll figure it out one day. The book's forthcoming. And so we continued over into let's be over here now this is the earth tablet and again the water subquadrant and the diagonal entity there is uh, Hongala it, it's 
so far, our experiences in the Earth tablet have produced uh, the, the interactions we have there. The entities seem to be less and less aware of themselves and what's going on. So Hongolo was able to identify as a demon. He also defined it as a secret servant. But he didn't really seem to know about the king, which was kind of odd. You know, the other guys were like, oh, we serve the king, we serve the king. And this guy was like, king of what? What are you talking about? You know, it's like almost like he wasn't really even aware of, of like, who he was serving. Yeah, exactly. And he showed up as this really super cool swamp rat, right? <laughs> and so this water of earth atmosphere was this seemingly unending channels of uh, streams, like very shallow streams and waters. And he, uh, so <laughs> Scott was scrying here. Um, he had has, he has Scott riding on his back through these channels of water that, that were very maze-like and seemed to never end, you know. But, any, but he, 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 when we asked him to contact Medimi, he didn't know who we were talking about, whereas the other guys seemed to have a sense of who we were talking about. Maybe they didn't either. But this guy was like, I don't know, I don't know. And uh, we were able to sort of prod him into like running through these channels. And I don't... He, I, I, we, ended up with, we ended up having an interaction with Medimi... But it wasn't clear to us exactly what he had to do. It's like she she showed up, you know. We kept asking him to find what her, asking what to find his her. role in facilitating that. He, one. Exactly, yeah. and this has been a theme um, in the Earth Tablet entities. When you get to Earth of Earth, it's even worse. You're like, who are you? What are you talking about? Mm. And so the level of like self awareness mm. actually seemed to change significantly with the Earth Tablet. And so, you know, we, we had all sorts of questions, you know, because here we have, in this first round, we have the raven, and we have the spider, and the nautilus, and this, like, swamp rat, all claiming to be demons with these, within these angelic environments. We were wondering, you know, were these some sort of, you know, because they're through the Calvary Cross, right there where the carubs are, were these, like, demonic carubs of the watchtowers? In each case, as I said, they you know they they identified themselves as demons. They defined that to mean a secret servant. And what we found is that the these guys weren't bound to their region. And as I said, we were we were using them to sort of attract entities outside of the watchtowers for us. Um, and so those were the water sub angles. And so then we go back and we do the same thing, but with that first quadrant, the air. And we start looking at those diagonal entities, and we're going to do each one. So when we go to Air of Hair, we have this really lively fellow. And the name there is Nemo. It's with an I, though, not an E. But we were still stoked. And, and this guy, he just wanted to, like, run. And one of the things that we really were... Some, some of the questions that we've been con consistently posing to Medimi, which... Uh, we'll come up in the slides here in a minute, but I'll go ahead and mention because something significant happens with this guy is we're really posing these questions. Remember, the Golden Dawn did a lot to incorporate work with these watchtowers. They didn't tell us a lot about how to talk to Medimi and, and the various heptarchic angels. And so we've found essentially this technique of contacting these diagonal entities and saying, hey, go get so-and-so, go get so-and-so. And so it's this sort of back door through the sort of bottom cracks of the watchtowers. We found these guys that can go out the back door and bring other guys to our attention, right? If you think of the watchtowers and the Golden Dawn system as being sort of an elemental representation of the universe, then we're thinking of the Heptarchic as being that planetary. So it's sort of this macro, micro, cosmic relationship. I mean, this is, this is us now thinking of it this way, imposing these sorts of questions to Medimi. And so through these conversations, Medimi has uh, begun to provide us with this two-dimensional sigil. I don't have a marker board, but it's, uh, it's 39X with this like circle cross and this other circle. Every time we talk to her, she gives us like another piece. And she's claiming that at the end, this is going to explain to us the relationship between the, the Watchtower entities and these Heptarchic entities. When we got to Nemo... 
he's like running all over the place, very excited, very airy, very swift, right? And he starts, all of a sudden, this two-dimensional sigil that Medimi was showing us appears on the ground. Nemo starts to run around it in circles really fast, and it grows right before our eyes into this three-dimensional thing. And so what we end up with, it's hard to describe, but it's this, so we have one pillar with another, like, small pillar right next to it, and at the top, it's, it's like a, a caged globe with what looks like a compass in the square poking out of it, which can move. And so this very sort of simple two-dimensional sigil becomes this like three-dimensional glyph with moving parts and all sorts of things. This glyph that's supposed to explain how the watchtower and the heptarchic regions are related to each other and how they interact has just, like, every time, it, it, it sort of grows into this more and more complicated thing that's, that's kind of difficult to understand. Interestingly, I, I won this, like, statue at Star Sapphire two years ago, and we started using it to control this three-dimensional glyph. And so it's, it's almost like an astrolabe of the, the area, It's the best I can say about it, but it's, it's a mystery, and we're still trying to figure that out. But this two-dimensional, Nemo is the one who who interacted with Medimi to make this two-dimensional uh, sigil grow into this three-dimensional glyph that's just been sort of a growing mystery for us. But Medimi promises that once we figure it out, we're going to have this great understanding about how the Watchtower and the Heptarchic regions interact and relate to each other. Um, this guy was really interesting. So we go over here into the air subquadrant of the fire tablet, and... In this case, we ended up in this, like, sort of like a meadow with electrical grids everywhere. And this guy was like this blue flame spark that sort of, it reminded me of like an old Mario Brothers game or something. It was like this old, like spark thing that just moved along this grid. And it spoke. It also was understood itself to be a demon, which it also defined to be a secret servant. Very weird talking to a spark. Now this guy, oh man. So we go to the water tablet, the air subquadrant of the water tablet, and okay, when well, we found a turtle sphinx, oh man, my, I knew I had made it. This was magical gold. I, like I had never in my life imagined a turtle sphinx. I can't even believe I found a picture that even almost kind of looks like him. And so uh, Akane was this turtle sphinx. And this was a really fascinating interaction because it was like the ocean, but it was like outer space. And the islands were like planets. And in this case, uh, Medimi showed up in this like, almost like a Hecate, like mini face. Like she just like had all these faces like changing and interacting. And, and, so, and so I should mention that each time that these guys put us in touch with Medimi... I'm like, show me your form, Medimi. Show me your form. I want to see you underneath the robe. No. <laughs> but she's toying with us the whole time about how she looks and how she appears. The first time, the first interaction we ever had with Medimi, it was a discarnate voice and, and a feeling. Like a very, like a, like a blissful, like her presence was like blissful. And so with, with each interaction... She sort of gives us a little bit more of a piece of her. And, and, and each time I, I ask, oh, show me your face, Medina, show me your face. And she's very coy and teasy, and, and this has been great fun for us. Um, but in this case, we really, you know, she came out, um, we're going through this space ocean, um, and we hit this island, and we asked for, you know, well, we asked for Medina, that's what started us through the thing, and, and she comes out, with this, like, changing body, changing face. You know, the, 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 at this point, this was the most corporal sort of version she's presented, and it's very, like, the many-faced god. You know? But, you know, we got to ride a turtle sphinx. And for me, I was, I was more than pleased with the turtle sphinx. Um, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And that's, you know, again, as I said before, you know, as you go through these watchtower entities, they will constantly challenge your preconceived notions of what an angelic entity is, what a demonic entity is, and so forth. So then we go back over here to the Earth sub-angle, and when we called up this guy, Scott was scrying, 
and he ended up, it was, we ended up in darkness. And that's usually not a cool way to start when you're scrying. But we heard things, and something was going on, and it was dark, and we couldn't see anything. And next thing you know, there's this little beetle, and he act, the light was actually on his head. It's hard to, I'm not a graphic artist. So <laughs> I just had to kind of had to work with what you can find Closest thing Google. I could find, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and th this guy, so far, and now this is Earth of Earth, you know, this guy was exceptionally not self-aware. <laughs> he called himself a demon, but he couldn't tell us what that meant. Uh, he didn't seem to really know anything about the king. This guy, imagine, so when he flipped the light on, it's like Dig Dug. Remember that old video game? We're in the earth, and there's just tunnels. And this guy is making the tunnels by eating what's in front of him and pooping it out. And so there's this, like, weird tunnels of, like, beetle poop earth dig dug style and because he flipped on the light to talk to us we're that's the only time we were able to really see anything and this guy was the the least self-aware really of anyone we've talked to we were not able to get Medimi to show up actually um and, and at the same time you know every time i ask Medimi, i say hey, Medimi, give me a method to contact you directly and she laughs at me <laughs> she says you're doing it you just did. You know, this is one of those places where, you know, you probably want to go back and refine, make your questions a little better. Mm -hmm. um, like, no, that's not what I meant. I meant, like, show me the direct way. You know, and she laughs and says, ah, oh, you've got it, you've got it. You know, it's this very coy, like, teasy thing that's been very fun with her. And so Medimi is daughter of the Daughters of Light. I didn't really go into details about the family of Light, but they're there's the, the Sons of Light, the Daughters of Light. And, Daughters of the Daughters of Light, and there's a certain hierarchy there. Medimi is one of the Daughters of the Daughters of Light. Medimi was one of the primary contacts um, for Dee and Kelly and their angelic workings, right up until the fateful end when she had them sleeping with their, each other's wives and stuff. Um, <laughs> so how did they contact her? Did she just show up when they did some kind of Yeah, you know, when, when Dee and Kelly, my understanding is that when Dee and Kelly started, they really started with trying to interact with Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, Oriel, the, the, the standard archangels of the quarters. And they really began with a very Solomonic, you know, the Solomonic grimoires were already available to these guys, you know. And so the beginnings of these workings were sort of mimicking that. In some cases, I mean, it was really just like D, like just rambling, ranting on and on with these holy prayers until Kelly caught something in the in the in the shoe glass, and and then they would say, "Ooh, what do you got?" You know, and then they would sort of question these things, and um, fairly quickly they were getting the, the the family of the family of light angels or ministers to the heptarchy, and they were sort of showing up as guides, and so um, there's a, there's a handful of them that they really interacted with frequently. But these were the guys that would show up and really address their questions, and if they couldn't address their questions, they knew ho essentially who to fetch to come and answer these questions. And so it was really through these family of light angels that you know a lot of the details of the Sinopian system are really made clear to these guys. And Medimi, I mean, Medimi was um, I believe uh, John Dee's daughter, he named one of his daughters after Medimi. Um, and so, you know, they were, like, very regular uh, angels that they interacted with and, and, and played a really significant role in them developing this material. And so, and Medimi, I, I would argue, is probably the most famous of all the angels within um, those seven years of scrying sessions. Um, and so that's why, you know, it's just... Um, the one that I focused on. And so, you know, she's been, you know, the, this is the person that we've been really posing a lot of these questions about, you know, hey, look, you know, we're working within this Golden Dawn approach. You know, we're not really sure how to directly interact with the heptarchic entities through this approach. You know, we're sort of trying, we, we, we're deter to trying to determine a direct method um, for being able to call the heptarchic family of light angels directly without having to go through this weird diagonal back door 
you know, Medimi has been slowly revealing uh, this set of sig sigils to us that are s supposed to help us understand the relationship between the Watchtowers and the Heptarchy. As I said with the, with the Nemo example, that 2D sigil grew into this 3D glyph with moving parts and it just <coughs> seems to get more complicated as we go. I constantly am asking her for a direct method. She likes to laugh at me and say, what do you think you've been doing this whole time? Now, one thing that, that she explained to me that I thought was pretty interesting and worthy of mention was she gave me a sense of... Because one thing I want to understand, if, if you look at... There's, there's more systems than even the Golden Dawn. There's the D-Purists, and there's you know everybody from D.R. Jones to somebody else has kind of taken things in different directions with how they work with this stuff. And what I find really fascinating is that in each case, it works. Every, each case... It doesn't matter if it's a Golden Dawn approach. It doesn't matter if it's a Deep Pierce approach. All of these people are getting results. It works. Why? And so I began sort of asking Medimi about why did, she, why did she demonstrate, why did she show these watchtowers to Dee and Kelly? And, and what she explained to me, I think, is very interesting and perhaps may even go um, some distance towards explaining why you can take this structure and you can map your whole system of, of, of cosmology and metaphysics and everything on top of it, work with it, and get results every time. It doesn't matter. You always you get results. And so this is the vision this of the watchtowers as they represent um, in one of the visions they were presented this way um, and so each watchtower has these guys coming out blowing horns with these banners and when I asked Medimi why she gave this vision to Dee and Kelly I thought her explanation was really interesting she, what she told me was that Dee and Kelly were overly and completely obsessed with this fear of impending doom, this notion that the apocalypse and the end of the world was imminent. Okay, and that s built up a lot of fear in their hearts. I mean, the whole time, Dee and Kelly were questioning: Are these really angels? Are these demons? What are we doing? You know, and so they they really lived. As most people did in these Elizabethan times, you know, they lived with a lot of fear in their heart. Fear of God, fear of the devil, fear of death, all of this, right? And so, Medini's explaining, ah, man, these guys would not shut up about the stupid apocalypse, you know. <laughs> and, and, and she says, by the way, the apocalypse happened. I was going to say, yeah, it happened already, right? Yeah, she's like, oh, and the apocalypse happened. And nothing, and no, no one died. She and I was like, I'm like, when did it happen? I wanted her to say 1904. Or <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, when did it happen? Give me a date. Give me a date. I couldn't, as she much was. as I tried to force her to, I pen, tried to paint her in the corner of 1904. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get 1904. But what she said is, she said, you know, these guys were so overly concerned with this impending doom, with this apocalypse, with the end of the world. You know, fear their mortal souls, all this. And so what they did was they said, look, there's these watchtowers of the earth. And look at all these angels guarding every direction. And look, it's okay, relax, you know, you're safe. You know, and so this whole vision of the watchtowers, according to Medini, was really about sort of putting Dee and Kelly's fears to rest so that they could get on with the fucking program of talking to God and figuring out, you know, this, the, 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 the hierarchies of angels in the heavens and so forth. And if you, under, if you take that at face value, then maybe you can start to realize that this was very, a very minor thing. It was, it was a show, in a way. And so it already is this template that Medimi filled in a certain way to sort of quell the fears of Dee and Kelly so they would shut the fuck up about the apocalypse and they could get on with the good stuff, right? And in my mind, if that's true, then it makes perfect sense why Mathers and Westcott and these Golden Dawn guys can take this same template and put their entire magical view of the universe on top of it 
and work with it and get some results. And that also explains why the, the next group can do it and the next group from the Hermeticists, Pope Runyon, and all these guys have done different things with these things. And they all get results. And I think that perhaps gives us some sense to why it all works anyway. Finally, I just have to point out that Medimi loves the Gnostic Mass. <laughs> um, early on, I, I don't know what came up. I, I, I think we had a Mass coming up a couple of days later, and I just had a hair up my ass, and I said, you know, hey, what about this Gnostic Mass thing? Da, 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 da. And she said, I'll tell you what, when you're in the tomb, say this, and I'll come to Mass. See? So the next Mass, I did that. And she came to Mass, and then we called her up the next time. Um, back then, we were, we, were, we were doing sessions every other week. And we called her up, and we said, Hey, what'd you think of Mass? And she's like, Oh, that was great! <laughs> she was able to tell me about like nuanced things I did at Mass, and things that she liked. And we had this cool discussion about Mass. And so for like the rest of that year, every time I did Mass, I was going to do this. <laughs> But, you know, we had these really cool discussions about mass. And this blew my mind, you know, that, uh, that we could, like, I could like, say this thing, do this cool mass, and then call up Medimi two weeks later and have a conversation about it. This, you know, we, when you're do one thing that Enochian adventures have done for me is it's really, you know, there, there is this, you know, Lon would say, oh, it's all in your head, you just don't know how big your head is. And, and that's fine, I can live with that too, but when you're having these experiences with spirits and something like this happens, there, it's hard not to have this very real feeling of dealing with this objective entity that, that is outside of yourself, that is, you know, not necessarily in your head, although that still may be true because maybe I just don't know how big my head is and that's cool too, but that's one thing that's really fun and really endearing about communicating and talking to these spirits is this sense of gaining knowledge that's completely outside of yourself and interacting with what very much seems like a subjective entity. And so, as we continue, we're going through and investigating those diagonal entities through that Calvary cross and all the various sub-quadrants, looking for some patterns, looking to make sense of this you know, we're pretty sure that we, we've stumbled across an order of entities. In fact, some of the later interactions, they describe themselves as being a member of, of an order of demons within the watchtowers. Haven't been able to get a name for that. Um, but there's a real sense that there, this is a grouping of entities within the watchtowers that have, some, that have a particular role there. They describe themselves as demons. They define that to mean a secret servant. Most of them claim to serve the kings. Um, we discovered very early on that they're not, they're not bound to their regions the way many of the other spirits are, and so we've used them to go outside of the watchtowers to contact the Heptarchic angels. Through the relationship we've developed with Medimi, she's she claims to be trying to explain stuff to us, but it's very riddly. We haven't made entire sense of it yet, but we hope to continue exploring um, methods of using this Golden Dawn, Lieber Chinook, bare bones, simplistic approach to working with these spirits that will take us outside of the watchtowers and the aethers, essentially. Does it feel to you like they're basically acting on instinct or some kind of primal impulse? So the, the, the levels of self-awareness are have been quite interesting. So, you know, you have a spectrum. Twelik, the guy that we came across first, naturally just visiting other guys, seems to be completely self-aware. He seems to understand that he's a member of an order of demons throughout the watchtowers. You know, and he's a guy we can kind of go back to regularly to sort of about some of the things that the other guys are saying. And he, he was seemed, in the air of air sphere, right? Was he in yeah, the air of air? He was water, in the water, water of air. Oh, water of air. That's who we found first. And yeah, like like I was saying, you know, when we get over to the Earth tablet, that seems to be the least self-aware entities there. Mm -hmm. And the water guys seem pretty self-aware, but less articulate. You know, so there's there's a little bit of nuance and there's a bit of a spectrum. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah. This is, this is thank, you. thank you so much.